Order, please. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing because following the Pledge of Allegiance, we will have a silent moment of reflection. I pledge allegiance to pledge the allegiance flag to of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under nation, God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Amen. We will have uh, the reading of the notice, please. An educational meeting of the Marathon County Board of Supervisors will be held at the Marathon County Courthouse Assembly Room, 500 Forest Street in the city of Wausau at 7 p.m. on Thursday, September 10th, and the agenda was duly signed and posted. Thank you. And I would like to request everyone in attendance to uh, silence their cell phones and any other electronic devices and all of the individuals that are on call in, please put your uh, phones on silent uh, as to not interrupt the meeting. And if you wish to uh, address the board, uh, you will be recognized by the chair. So we will proceed to roll call. I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Bistrom. Boots. Book. Bootkey. Here. Christensen. Here. Siler. Here. Conway. Here. Dickinson. Here. Drabeck. Fisher. <coughs> Here. Gaber. Here. Gibbs. Here. Gonnering. Here. Guild. Here. Gums. Harris. Jacobson. Here. Johnson. Here. Krause. Here. Lamont. Here. Longenhan. Here. Leahy. Here. Low. Here. Mask. Here. McEwen. Here. Oberbeck. Here. Opal. Robinson. Here. Rosenberg. Here. Schley. Here. Seafelt. Here. Soybert. Here. Stark. Here. Van Cray. Here. Vole. Boots. Book. Here. Gums. Harris. Thank you. And I would like to request everyone in attendance to uh, sign up for cell phones and any other electronic. Vol. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I would like to welcome all of the guests and visitors that we have here, all in, including the viewing audience. And we have uh, up under item number seven, uh, 15 minute public comment, and we have one individual, one resident that has uh, requested to address the board, uh, and it is a former supervisor uh, for the county board, Joanne Leonard. So the, uh, the floor is yours. Joanne, uh, and if you would, uh, the mic, we can use the mic here. Oh, you can use uh, that right there on the floor. 
Uh, the one on the floor, Joanne. Yep, sorry. Just slide the bottom. You would think after 10 years on the county board, I'd know where all the buttons are on these microphones. First of all, my name is Joanne Leonard. I live at 923 Maple Hill Road in Wausau, and I'm a former 10-year member of the county board. Even though the resolution I'm speaking to has been taken off the agenda tonight, I believe everyone in this audience knows what it says. And I apologize to the county board supervisors who will have to listen to my comments a second time, but think it is important that all supervisors hear them. It offends me to have to be here to speak about the, uh, quote, resolution declaring Marathon County no place for hate, unquote. I've been appalled ever since I read the title of this resolution. My husband and I have lived in Marathon County for 52 years. We have been involved in many aspects of the county's ups and downs, from my husband's work struggling to get technical education for students in the Wausau school system, to my involvement with the development of a Hmong radio program to many years ago. Several of us wanted to give a voice to the elder Hmong population who we knew never would be able to learn our difficult language. We wanted them to be part of our community. That initiative was a big success and has run for many years. In 52 years of living here, we have never and still don't find this a hateful community or county. And neither of us are sitting home in our rocking chairs. So we are out and about in the community so we know how people are treating each other. Words like hate, disparity of opportunity, um, that was in the resolution, which was changed from white privilege in the original resolution and systemic inequality, really means racism from the original document are inflammatory words that only incite the very things this community is not. The words insinuate that people are hateful, racist, or privileged based on their birth. Do we have differences of opinions, background, and experiences? Yes, but as was the case when the Hmong people arrived in Wausau, differences can be resolved by working together. Using these types of words fosters the very ideology that this resolution says we should not have. We can only change people's hearts by our act actions toward positive growth and mutual understanding, not by continually pointing out how bad and hateful we all are. I'm asking the Marathon County Board to not approve this resolution if and when it comes to the full board for a vote. This county does not need a resolution with the word hate in it or any other inflammatory language. The board should focus on its statutory obligations. Those obligations are issues such as the county debt, our environment, our quality of roads, safety for taxpaying residents and businesses, helping those who can't help themselves through our wonderful county social services and the many other positive services that this county has. I want to remind the board who elected them the taxpaying members of this county. The county board needs to stop focusing on issues that can only be resolved by your actions and collaboration, not by words on a piece of paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, we only had the uh, one uh, individual register for public comment, so I want to thank that person and we will move on to item number eight, education presentation and reports. Standing committee chairpersons or designees. Any? Mr. Chairman. Who is that please? Supervisor Robinson. Supervisor Robinson's recognized. I'd like to just give a very quick update on the finance committee meeting which took place on Tuesday. Of uh, the primary point of discussion was a request from the village of Maine to receive payments in lieu of taxes on a proposed uh, county facility that may be 
located in the village. As you know, the county has been looking at a potential new location for the county highway facilities, parks department, uh, conservation zoning planning, and in other um, departments. And one of the potential locations is in the village. And the village has um, expressed a desire to receive payments in lieu of taxes from the county for the location of <coughs> that facility there. The uh, finance committee unanimously um, opposed the payment of a payment in lieu of taxes. It would set a very dangerous precedent and it could cost several million dollars a year um, in county levy to be paid to other units of government. Um, and we have not made payments in lieu of taxes to any other government. Uh, so uh, look for more to come. And then just a reminder to the finance committee that we will be having a special meeting on Tuesday at 630 to consider the um, the bonding for the or the accept the bids for the bonds associated with the resolution on the agenda later today. Thank you. Any other committee chairs or designees? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to item 8B, Progressive Women in Wisconsin and the Struggle for Women's Suffrage, it from 1880 to 1920. And we have with us uh, a presenter, Paul Clark, uh, uh, history teacher at Wasa East uh, High School and uh, Supervisor Krause uh, would like to introduce. Supervisor Thank Krause. Thank you, please bear with me while I read the introduction. Um, it took 144 years from the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776 to August 18, 1920, before women achieved the right to vote. Tennessee was the 38th and last state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. Just this year, in August 2020, U.S. Secretary David L. Bernhardt traveled to Nashville, Tennessee where the Trump administration announced the designation of the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee as a National Historic Landmark in recognition of the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution allowing women the right to vote. The Hermitage Hotel was a critical centerpiece for the women's suffrage movement as the hotel was used by the suffragettes as their headquarters to secure Tennessee's ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Thank you to Senator Blackburn and Senator Alexander for their leadership in emphasizing the importance of the Hermitage Hotel as a national historic landmark. If you are over 40, I would say, I'm not sure that you were aware of or read and studied about uh, the women's suffrage movement. I know I didn't, and that was 50, 60 years ago. But nowadays, children are learning it in grade school and in high school. And women's studies uh, programs, of course, are always emphasizing that. In partnership with the Wisconsin Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and the Department of Public Instruction, the Society has developed History Makers, a Wisconsin women's history classroom resource, which is available on the, w, the Wisconsin Counties Association website. I would like to introduce to you Paul Clark. He has been a 20-year teacher at East High School, and he's taught journalism, composition, U.S. history, European history, psychology. He has been a track and cross-country coach for many years. He currently teaches 20th century U.S. history and international baccalaureate European history for college credit. He will be covering the women's suffrage movement from 1880 to 1920, which is only 40 years. But as you know today, it is still ongoing where women work towards full participation in society in all areas of life. Thank you. Mr. Paul Clark, you are you have the stage, and you will you have the should have presenter uh, authority. Okay, is the audio working? It is. Thank you. 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor, and uh, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, I hope to keep the story of uh, women's suffrage focused on uh, Wisconsin, and particularly when possible, central Wisconsin. Um, so I, I know you have many items on your agenda, so I'd like to kind of hit the highlights. Just to show you, as I like to show my students, that central Wisconsin, in particular in Wisconsin, uh, have played a significant role in um, these national trends. So I'm gonna share my screen now, um, which I think is gonna work. Are you currently seeing my screen now? No, we're still seeing you. Still seeing me. That's not as good as my screen. <laughs> there there that, we go. I think now we've better. got it. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Okay. So I, I would I would like to begin this by uh, taking a look at this statue. Um, many of you are familiar with this statue. Uh, unfortunately, it's been in the news uh, recently for um, not for reasons of women's suffrage. Uh, but this is, uh, the statue is called Forward, and it stands on uh, the Capitol Square uh, where State Street comes into the Capitol Square. And it was uh, sculpted by a uh, Madison sculptor named Jean Pond Minor uh, in 1893 for uh, the Chicago World's Fair. Um, and she holds her hand up while uh, grasping an American flag. And I think that the title of this is fitting, it's forward. Um, and I think that as, as I can talk about just a couple of things here, we'll see that this idea of um, moving forward in a progressive sense has been very important in uh, understanding suffrage for women in Wisconsin and in uh, Wausau as well. To understand what's happening in the late 1800s, we have to to, to get what happens with population. Uh, population was growing incredibly rapidly. Uh, people were moving to the cities because of uh, farms becoming untenable, because of immigration, uh, and because of westward expansion. It's hard to think of Wausau as the West then, but that's what it was. Uh, and between 1870 and 1880, Wausau doubled in size, doubled in population. And then again, between uh, 1880 and 1900, Wausau tripled in population. Um, so it, during that time, it goes from a population of uh, 1,300 individuals to, uh, to 12,300 uh, people. And with that is going to come all kinds of problems. Um, notably, many of the problems have to do with children. Uh, lack of sanitation, lack of uh, uh, clean water, Lack of good housing affected Wausau as it did many major cities at this time. Uh, and because of that, infant mortality was incredibly high. Uh, in 1882, a report from Marathon County showed that one third of the deaths in 1882 uh, consisted of children less than one years of age. Um, so it, it just kind of shows you the problem that infant mortality was uh, and during that same year in 1882, 25 women died in childbirth. Uh, these were problems that affected every family uh, or, or you had relatives that were affected by uh, infant mortality uh, in their household. Um, on top of that, you have a, a lot of challenges with the very nature of the work that was done in Wausau and Marathon County. Um, lumbering and, and sawmill work uh, was was very dangerous, and it didn't pay well. If we look at, at the conditions um, for most workers at this time, um, half of all workers earned less than $1.50 a day, um, which is maybe hard to imagine in relative terms, but over half, 52% of households uh, were below the poverty line uh, in uh, the 1880s and 1890s. Child labor was very common uh, in textile mills in the southern part of the state, but even in Wausau at the Curtis Brothers uh, uh, Millwork and, and Window Factory, uh, if you look at the top row here, uh, you can see the selection of kids. And they actually, um, in 1916, Curtis Brothers uh, did let uh, the, the kids go to school for three hours a day uh, to, to let them have some education. 
Um, on top of all of that, alcohol use was incredibly white, widespread. This is uh, actually not Wassa, it's Schofield, uh, but Schmidt's Five Mile uh, was, was a tavern that's been around for a long time. And to put things in perspective as far as drinking, uh, during this time in the late 1800s, the average American uh, consumed, this is per capita, not everyone did it, but the average American consumed the equivalent of 88 bottles of whiskey per year. Uh, that's for average American over 15. And to put things in perspective as far as the saloons, um, Wisconsin is still known for having many saloons or bars per capita. Uh, the, the top metro area today in the nation is La Crosse, Wisconsin, with one bar for every 1,400 residents. Marathon County, during this time, uh, had one saloon for every 350 residents. Uh, so it certainly put La Crosse to shame, okay? Uh, on top of the problems of alcohol, infant mortality, uh, uh, poverty, uh, unsafe working conditions, uh, you had political corruption, political machines that ran the cities, uh, and uh, corporations, especially railroads, uh, used their, their money to buy influence. So it, it kind of makes sense that women at this time uh, looked around, especially middle and upper class women, and they said, okay, we're living in a, in a country that is immoral, it's unhealthy, it's violent, it's corrupt, and it's a society in which we seem to be decaying instead of progressing, instead of moving forward. And by the very nature of uh, femininity and, and womanhood at this time, issues like infant mortality uh, and alcoholism seem to affect women as more vulnerable than others. So before women got into the suffrage movement, they sought to reform these problems. Uh, alcohol, conditions for children, and uh, poverty. And so you know, the normal narrative in a history textbook is that people like Upton Sinclair um, <clears throat> and tragic events like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City uh, convinced politicians like Teddy Roosevelt and Big Bill Taft and uh, Woodrow Wilson and Wisconsin's own Bob La Follette to reform things, and that's what they did. But before those politicians did a thing, it was really women uh, in Wisconsin and in Wausau that took uh, the leading role in these reforms. Okay, so it was really these upper middle and upper class women uh, who took it upon themselves at a local level to get involved in education, uh, to get involved in the anti-alcohol movement uh, and, and other reforms. Uh, one of them that's quite famous for Wisconsin is Lutte Stearns. Uh, she started what became the Bookmobile, with the idea being that if you can educate children, you can help improve their lives. Um, and you may be familiar with that. Um, another, there's just an image of an early Bookmobile. Um, another reformer during this time is Lizzie Black Kander. She started uh, Milwaukee's first settlement house. And settlement houses sought to reform poverty by taking um, the, the help kind of directly to where it was needed. Uh, in this case, um, classes in sanitation, classes in uh, child care, uh, English language classes, and quite famously for Lizzie Black Kander, um, the publication of the Settlement House Cookbook, or the Settlement Cookbook, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, when it came to alcohol, Wisconsin, uh, specifically had a huge role in the anti-alcohol movement. This was the um, Wisconsin, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Women's Christian Temperance uh, Union led by Frances Willard. Uh, she was from Janesville. Uh, her deputy was from Ripon, Wisconsin. Uh, so Wisconsin quite either ironically or appropriately uh, had a huge role in the anti-alcohol crusade and women in these activities, whether it was anti-alcohol uh, and, and I would say when it comes to the temperance movement, one of my favorites is that women would go up to lumber camps and preach about the evils of alcohol in the wintertime in, in lumber camps. And um, when it comes to the, the 18th Amendment, uh, women took, the, took the, the leading role in that and these other reform movements, but in so doing also gained political experience 
that they would use for suffrage. Okay? And so after having a lot of experience in these other reforms, um, educational reforms, uh, child welfare reforms, anti-poverty measures, and anti-alcohol, women then targeted suffrage uh, wholeheartedly in the early 1900s. Uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had started the suffrage movement back in 1848. They did come and speak in Wausau in uh, 1876 and 1877. Uh, so they, they were here at the old opera house. Uh, and by the early 1900s, you had two separate organizations in the United States. One is NASA, the National Association uh, of uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, excuse me, led yes. by Carrie Chapman Catt. And they sought to get suffrage in a state by state level. At the national level, you had Alice Paul, younger, more militant, sought an amendment to the Constitution. Now, in the history of national women's suffrage, Wisconsin again plays a significant leading role because Wisconsin led by the Wisconsin chapter of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, tried to get statewide suffrage here. And in 1912, the Wisconsin Women's Suffrage Association led a huge campaign that was very costly, consisted of speaking from the back of cars in various towns and villages. Um, they harnessed some of the newest technology and had a statewide plan. Uh, they sent a, uh, a gasoline-powered ship up the Wolf River uh, to, to uh, give speeches along there, disseminated uh, pamphlets during the state fair from an airplane, uh, which would be pretty um, high-tech in 1912. However, this referendum failed. It failed 67% to uh, 33%. Um, so this, this was a, a major blow to the women's suffrage movement at the national level. Um, and, and, and just as a side note, the big opponents of this were uh, the saloons who were convinced that if women had the vote in Wisconsin, the saloon would be a thing of the past. Um, but the effect of this Wisconsin referendum was it convinced the uh, national women's suffrage organizations that they needed to go for a federal amendment and not try to fight the state by state battle. OK, so. This Wisconsin movement did have an, an effect on the overall strategy of the national movement. It really took World War I to be the main impetus for women to get uh, suffrage when the suffrage movements decided to rally behind the flag and work towards patriotic causes uh, as a way to, to kind of like fight for the vote as well. Um, and then that did happen. Uh, in the sense of kind of harnessing patriotism and working towards a common cause uh, with the campaign, uh, finally getting the backing of Woodrow Wilson in uh, 1918. Uh, and then Wisconsin became the first in the ratification struggle in uh, 1919. OK, um, so if we think about like Wisconsin's place in this, one of the things to understand is that it is a long kind of backstory to this. Wisconsin's uh, women got involved in many reform movements first, and it really is kind of a, a long crusade, and that's what women called it at the time uh, as well. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about these topics, uh, there's a couple of sources that I've used and found uh, helpful. Uh, these are two specific to Wisconsin, uh, and then this is more of a, I, I think, an actually a, an excellent women's history in America uh, book in general. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of throw this out there if I can. Uh, there we go. Um, the Marathon County Historical Society uh, also will have a talk with uh, Ben Clark uh, next uh, Saturday, September 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, and he's their archivist and will share a lot of details on uh, women specifically in Wausau. So when we think about the uh, kind of like women's right to vote and the long fought battle. I think it's important that we understand that Wisconsin was so central to this and that it took place uh, even in our own backyard and here in Marathon County uh, and in Wausau. And just as a side note, the statue that uh, the forward statue that was torn down uh, this June is not actually the original. The original 
uh, resides uh, securely in the State uh, Historical Society. That was a replica that was torn down. Uh, that replica was built uh, or made in 1995. So again, just a few things that I wanted to to share with you guys, uh, and hopefully can highlight the um, the role of Wisconsin uh, and 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 Marathon County in particular uh, in the struggle for women's suffrage. So thank you very much uh, for that opportunity. Well, thank you, Mr. Clark, and I would uh, invite any any county board members if they have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Clark? Supervisor Krause. I have a question. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton visiting this area. Well, it was, it was, and the, the newspaper articles I found from the old um, uh, Record Herald um, really did emphasize that, I mean, so Stanton at the time would have been, she would have been, a little bit older. She would have been in, in her mid to late 70s. Um, and it's interesting to see that the newspaper accounts of it stress uh, her youthfulness, uh, her uh, well-kept appearance, uh, and and Stanton would have given um, one of her many kind of set speeches on women's suffrage. Uh, the speaking circuit was known for that at this time. Uh, and so she gave kind of her one of her textbook arguments for why women deserve the vote. Um, and that's about what I could gather from from the old newspaper articles. Okay, uh, Supervisor Robinson, you have your hand raised. I think you I'm have- Sorry, I need to take it off for before, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I was wondering if um, there's any history on the descendants of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I believe she had a daughter that followed through uh, with, Lucy's, uh, with Lucy Stone's daughter in uh, working with, you know, as generations went on, working for women to get the right to vote. There may be, but I'm not familiar with that. Um, I do know that Stanton and, and Anthony both um, had some relatives that were involved in the National Women's Party. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, Mr. Clark, I want to thank you. Uh, great presentation and, and great education on uh, the, uh, the women's uh, involvement and in particular the local women's involvement in the the uh, suffrage movement, uh, the one thing I, I would explain to the board, uh, yesterday's executive committee meeting had to be canceled. And so uh, the resolution uh, is unfortunately not on the agenda for passage tonight uh, or on Tuesday, uh, but uh, we had uh, scheduling and uh, I had scheduled uh, Mr. Clark and he was so gracious to uh, change after last month's uh, uh, movement of that uh, uh, agenda item because the executive committee didn't take it up and uh, and then, then yesterday again, so he was scheduled and I felt it was not fair to him to have to reschedule him a, a second, a third time. And so I, I really do appreciate his willingness to uh, present the education tonight uh, and uh, the uh, board will be taking that agenda item up uh, as soon as the executive committee has had a chance to act on it. So I thank you again, Mr. Clark, for the presentation. And so we will move on. And uh, we will move on to review and discussion of Tuesday meeting agenda items. And I will make a couple of notes. Item 9B 2A, expand one point, uh, expand one point six FTE motorized recreation coordinator to 0.75 resolution 56 dash 20 has been pulled along with uh, item 9B2E, resolution approving the 2021 uh, capital improvement program projects, resolution 60-20 has been pulled. Uh, the uh, finance committee on those items uh, uh, were uh, moved to further discussion. And so they were not brought forward to the executive committee uh, or to the full board. 
So we'll start with item uh, nine, review and discuss, uh, discussion of Tuesday meeting agenda items. Item 9A, appointments, and under, either, under item 9A1, Rib Mountain Metropolitan Sewage uh, District Commission. Appointing Keith Biederman, 209 Willow Street, Mosinee, to the Rib Mountain Metropolitan Sewerage District Commission for a five-year term to expire August 31st, 2025. Any discussion on that appointment? Moving on to item 9A2, Veterans Service Commission. Appointing Anthony Stangy, 1844 Judy Drive, Cronenwetter, to the Veterans Service Commission for a three-year term to expire December 31st, 2023. Any discussion on that appointment? Okay, moving on to resolutions under 9B. 9B1, Environmental Resources Committee, under item 9B1A, approval of the Town of Rib Mountain Local Zoning Ordinance Am Amendment, resolution 54-20. Any questions on that resolution? Okay, moving on to item 9B, 1B, approval of the Town of Castle Local Zoning Ordinance Amendment, Resolution 55-20. Any questions? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, this is Supervisor Langenhans. Supervisor Langenhans, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, this might be a little preemptive, but I would like to request abstention on Tuesday's vote concerning this item. Abstention would be granted. Uh, just uh, please remind me on Tuesday that your uh, requ uh, your qu request, and I will uh, uh, grant that. Any any other uh, discussion? Any other discussion on the town of uh, item nine B one B town of uh, Castle local zoning ordinance amendment resolution fifty five dash twenty. Seeing none, we'll move on to item uh, 9B2, Human Resources Finance and Property Committee. Again, reminding everyone that item 9B2A uh, has been pulled. So we will look at item 9B2B, create 1.5 FTE custodial positions for the Facilities and Capital Management Department, resolution 57-20. Any questions? Okay, item 9B2C, create 1.0 deputy sheriff in the Marathon County Sheriff's Office to provide contractual services for the Town of Rib Mountain, resolution 58-20. Any questions? Okay, item 9B, 2D, resolution awarding the sale of $17,845,000 general obligation health care project building bonds series 2020B, resolution 59-20. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will move on to item three from the Infrastructure Committee. Item 9B3A, 2020 County Bridge and Culvert Aid, Resolution 62-20. Any 
Any questions, any discussion? Okay, well, we move on, on to item 9B4, Health and Human Services Committee. Item 9B4A, Second Amendment Inter Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement between Lincoln, excuse me, Langlade County, Lincoln County, Marathon County, and Wood County, Resolution 63-20. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, this is Supervisor Seiler. I'm trying to raise my hand. I don't know if it's coming through. Supervisor Seiler, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a question for uh, Corp Council uh, on this. Um, because there's so much language here, I wonder if you could point out what has been added in the Second Amendment. Um, because I, this morning at ADRC, um, our copy of this was very um, convenient because we had the first amendments were printed in red and then the second amendments in blue. So that was very helpful. And I wonder if you could help the board or just point out what we are actually looking at today, what this, the second amendment is and where it's located in this document. Sure. Um, Thank um, you. One, of the, one of the initiatives um, brought forward by the healthcare center at the end of last year uh, was the possibility of adult protective services moving from North Central Healthcare to supervision by um, the um, ADRC. And, um, and uh, that was a move that was uh, uh, very well supported by the, um, by the ADRC. It's also supported by uh, North Central Healthcare Board. Um, what the amendment does is it does not actually create the transfer at this time, but it empowers the ADRC board to contract for those services through Adult Protective Services in, in the discretion of the ADRC board. So we're actually at work um, uh, drafting the terms and conditions of that kind of contract. The amendment that is before the board simply empowers the um, ADRC board to contract in that way uh, if they are satisfied with the terms and conditions of the contract that we're drafting. The second part of the amendment that's being offered has to do with um, commingling of funds um, for ADRC, uh, for commingling of funds from the ADRC um, with Adult Protective Services, and it's a prohibition against that happening. Um, folks are very concerned about um, whether or not, um, uh, because um, uh, Adult Protective Services in um, Lincoln, Langlade, and Marathon County is a unified department. Wood County has separate Adult Protective Services. Uh, folks in Wood County are concerned that, uh, that funds that are paid to the ADRC by Wood County would become commingled with uh, uh, and used for adult protective services in other counties. And uh, essentially the uh, amendment prohibits that from happening. Okay. And, and again, if I may, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could request court counsel, can you point out exactly what, where those uh, changes are made in this lengthy <laughs> document, uh, where the insertion of that is? I'm sure. I'm. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not looking at that, <clears throat> but oh, I'm sorry. The, you don't have but the sections um, uh, uh, the administrator has has uh, has provided me the notation. Uh, the sections can be found at section 4.02 sub e. That's the portion that deals with the empowerment of the ADRC board to contract, and then section 5.06. Um, has to do with the uh, use of funds, um, and in there we've added additional language to say that uh, those funds won't, will not be commingled. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions by or 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 uh, discussion by uh, board members? OK, 
Okay, we will move on to item 9B, 4B. <clears throat> endorse the creation of enabling legislation by the state of Wisconsin for a regional transit authorities, resolution 64-20. Any discussion? Okay, we will move on. Items 9B5, uh, Executive Committee, Resolution. Item A, Resolution Declaring Marathon County No Place for Hate has been pulled. Item uh, B, Resolution for uh, Commemorating the 100th Anniversary has been pulled uh, due to lack of Executive Committee action. And Supervisor Harris, you are now recognized, and I apologize for not recognizing you sooner. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, no, I was just going to say briefly, um, in terms of the regional transit um, uh, initiative, um, I think it, it would be an important initiative for the, uh, the county to move forward on, uh, is basically um, stating that uh, we would like the legislature to make, um, to allow for um, different um, communities to be able to communicate with each other with regards to um, creating um, different means for transportation. Um, this will allow them to um, possibly expand transportation and work together, um, which I think would, would help a lot of people, uh, residents in our community here. So I think it'd be a positive initiative moving forward. Thank you, and I again apologize for not recognizing you uh, and, and moving on. Any other, uh, any other discussion? We are down now to item number 10, announcements and or requests. I do have uh, two different announcements. Uh, again, uh, uh, reiterating what the Chairman of Health uh, HR uh, Finance Committee has a special meeting at 6.30 on Tuesday at 9.15 to review and uh, review the bids and potentially award the bids for the bonding. Uh, and then uh, the uh, other uh, announcement that I have, if uh, you have received the Wisconsin Counties Association magazine, in there uh, is written articles. Uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, the annual convention has been uh, canceled. Uh, ex uh, postponed, I should say, uh, clarifying. And uh, they, but th some of the topics and educational seminars are reprinted in the Wisconsin Counties Magazine, and they're also going to be provided in a webinar format, starting uh, with the uh, first one, uh, September 28th, uh, Cyber Threats to Public Safety. Uh, Monday, October 5th, Promoting Diversity in County Boards. Uh, November 2nd, Serving Our Aging Population. November 9th, Preparing uh, for an Emergency You Hope You Never Happens. Media and Communications. I apologize for backing up. I had my pages backwards. On Monday, October 12th, they'll be implementing pretrial justice in Wisconsin. Uh, Monday, October 19th, large livestock sighting. Where do we go from here? And then last but not least is item uh, October 28th, PFAS, what do we need to know? Um, so all of those are open to every supervisor. Um, if you actually attend the uh, WCA, if you've had the opportunity to attend the WCA, you know you would be limited to the number of uh, educational workshops that you could attend. In this case, now you have the option and opportunity to attend all of the workshops uh, and they're free. All you have to do is register and you'll be uh, able to uh, attend those. Um, any other announcements from the board? Okay, seeing Mr. Stark? none. Go ahead. Wait, 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 Supervisor Stark. Supervisor Stark is recognized. I think you made an error on the finance meeting. You said 9-15. I believe it said 6-30. 9-15-2020 at 6-30, correct. 
All right, never mind. I thought you said it was at 9.15. Sorry. 9.15 being the date. Any, uh, we're down to uh, item number 11, adjournment. Vice Chair McEwen with a motion and Supervisor Drabeck with a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you everyone for attending.